Oh, that is our song. That is why we are here. Uh, you, ha- you have been good to us. You've been gracious to us, merciful to us. In countless ways, many that we take for granted, many that we forget, but most supremely in your Son to rescue us from brokenness and enable us to be set free, live lives of joy and meaning and purpose. So we just say thank you for your goodness and your grace. We pray this in your name, Jesus, as our King. Amen. You can grab a seat. Good morning, Fellowship Fayetteville. How are we? It's pretty good on Memorial Day weekend. I'll take that. Um, my name's Garland. Uh, let me ask you just to consider for a moment and just think about this question. What is the most out of place you've ever felt in your life? Like the most uncomfortable, weird, awkward, out of place you've ever felt in your life. Uh, Maybe you've traveled abroad or lived abroad, and those first few days or first few weeks, you looked around and and no one looked like you, no one talked like you, it was a different language, you just felt really, really out of place. Maybe you've had that same experience even within our own country. Maybe you've traveled to uh, one of the cities, if you're from the South, and you found it to be a very different experience, or maybe you moved here from a different part of the world, and this place seems really out of place. It could be that you, you're a student and you moved here and everything about Northwest Arkansas is just very different than where you came from and it feels out of place. Maybe it could be that this morning, like right now is the most out of place you've ever felt because you've never been to church before and somebody invited you or you found yourself in here this morning and we're singing songs and we're passing a plate and somebody's up here now talking and we have the Bible being read in just a minute. And you're like, what is this thing? By the way, if that's you, welcome. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. But I... I that could be somebody in this room this morning going, what is going on, this whole thing called church? Uh, just a personal example for me, uh, this is one of my more embarrassing out-of-place kind of weekends. Uh, I've been out of the country and been uh, overseas in places where no one looked like me, talked like me, sounded like me, uh, but one of these, was, uh, these experiences was in our own country. Uh, we traveled to New York uh, several times, uh, my wife and I, with different groups of people, and uh, it's really fun. I always love visiting, and whenever I visit a place especially a place in America, I always desperately want to not look like a tourist, all right? I want to blend in. I want to not stand out as not from around here. But this was a particular trip we made to New York, and the weather app basically lied to us. It said it was going to be warmer than it was, and it ended up being much colder when we got to the city than we realized, and so we didn't pack accordingly. And what we did is every day, we essentially had to wear everything that we had brought with us just to stay warm while we were out there. Now, I don't know, if, if you've never been to New York, let me let you in. A lot of the native New Yorkers, like when you walk around the street in New York, a lot of the people in the city, um, they wear a lot of like grays and blacks and browns. Like it's just, there's not a lot of color when you walk around the streets. And sometimes it can be really obvious when you see somebody in really bright colors that that person's not from here. Well, we had packed everything, but we were wearing everything every day and I had packed a rain jacket in case it rained, but it didn't rain. It was just that cold, and I didn't plan on wearing this thing everywhere we went, but it's really hard not to look like a tourist when you're wearing big red everywhere you go. Of course, when my wife is also mocking me for it, everywhere we went, I have this thing on, and everybody, everybody, as I'm walking by, I'm I'm trying not to look like a tourist, but look at me. Look at this dork walking around New York, and every time I open my mouth in a coffee shop or in a restaurant, I don't think I have a a, a southern accent. You could tell me if you think otherwise, but every place we would go, the second I would begin to speak, they would go, now, where are you from? Uh, It was very, very obvious that I wasn't from there, okay? Now, if you've had that experience, maybe you've lived overseas, maybe you've moved here, maybe you've moved into different parts of even within our own country, that experience can be really jarring, Like, it can be really uncomfortable for you. Um, It can come with some anxiety, some fear, even. And what we're going to see as we dive into this summer, this letter, this ancient letter that the Apostle Peter wrote to these churches in what we now call Turkey, he's going to refer to them as exiles over and over again in the letter. He's going to say, you're like foreigners. You don't fit in. 
And the question then becomes, how should we live? How should they live then and how should we live now? What's their calling as exiles, foreigners in the culture in which they find themselves? Welcome to 1 Peter. We're going to spend 12 weeks looking at this letter. It is profound. It is powerful. It is inspiring. It is challenging. And we're going to spend 12 weeks getting to dive in and study. Now, it's not by accident. This letter is going to continue some of the themes that we've already looked at this year, going back to Daniel and Esther. We've been talking about the way of faithful presence, the way of the exile. We're going to keep going, okay? But now we're looking at it from a New Testament letter perspective. First Peter. We ready? I got to preach on, which that's all I needed, all right? That's all I needed. Okay. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to First Peter. It's toward the back, okay? If you're in Revelation, move back a few pages, and you'll get there eventually, okay? So go to the very end, move back a few pages. Shameless plug for sermon notes real fast. Uh, sermon notes is where we try to give some of the conversations and study that we have that just doesn't make the time in here. Um, we're going to have an intro background stuff on sermon notes this week, a little deeper dive. So some of your questions, if you have them, uh, if you're a history nerd and you want to dive into some of that, th- some of that will be on sermon notes this particular week. Let's look at 1 Peter. We're diving in chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Here's how this letter begins. Peter, a sent one, a messenger, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, just pause. When you dive into a letter or a book of the Bible, it can be a bit of a strange experience because, especially in the case of letters, both ancient and modern, you're stepping into an ongoing conversation. So when you begin a letter, it's as if you have to understand and presuppose what's going on. And that requires a little bit of work. We have to understand what is going on. Even just getting through one verse, we got to do some background and some intro. Now, I went back and looked. I have now given the intro talk for our last four book series. I'm the intro guy now, okay? I'm like the background intro history guy. And I couldn't be happier about it, all right? So let's do a little bit of background about what's going on in this letter, okay? We gotta understand uh, some of how we can make sense of this ongoing conversation. First, who's our author? We have Peter. Now, if you are not, uh, if you have not grown up around churches, maybe this is your first time being exposed to anything about the Bible, who's Peter, okay? Peter is a really big deal. He was in Jesus's inner circle, one of Jesus's closest friends. In fact, Peter plays a very prominent role in many of the stories that we call the Gospels. There's so many stories, you just hard to even pick and choose one. He's the one that Jesus says, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. He was very influential in the first few decades of this Jesus movement breaking out, not only among Jews in Israel, but Peter's mind was blown in Acts chapter 10 as the gospel began to move from the Jewish community into the non-Jewish Gentile community. But then in the book of Acts, Peter sort of takes a back seat after, the, uh, after chapter 10. He only shows up a couple more times, and we have to rely on what we call church tradition to kind of make sense of the rest of Peter's life. And church tradition has him doing ministry in Israel, but then moving to Rome, the heart of the empire. And doing ministry in Rome for several years before his death, somewhere in the 60s AD is where most scholars place it. So he's writing this letter, and we can even see that in chapter five. He's writing this letter from Rome, the heart of the empire. Look at it, verse 13. She, probably meaning the church, the church who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends her greetings. But he calls it Babylon. Notice that. Peter writes from the capital, the center of the ancient world, a city that both ancient and modern people look at. They see the splendor and the wonder and the glory of Rome. It was envied by all around. You had to 
fall at the feet of Rome to do business. It was the largest empire in the world. It's beautiful and powerful. What did Peter call it? What does he call it? Babylon. What is he doing? I want you to see it. Right off the bat, you got to see how Peter's working, okay? This is a very regular feature of what, is, what comes to be known as a, an apocalyptic uh, style of writing. It wants to change your perspective. See, everyone saw Rome as glorious, beautiful, and powerful. Peter says, no, 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 Babylon. That's reflecting a tradition that goes all the way back to the stories in Genesis. What does Babylon represent? Babylon represents the city or the empire that tries to make a name for itself using technology and exploitation. It builds its glory and grandeur up, trying to bring the gods down on their own terms. And it's filled with injustice and idolatry. It's reflected in the the kingdom of Pharaoh in Egypt and Nineveh and Babylon. And now Peter says, don't be fooled by the beauty of Rome. No, no, see through it because it's a beast. It's Babylon. Just a quick, quick hit for all of us in the room. When you see the glorious city, the glorious nation, the glorious empire, do you see through its flaws? Do you see through its idolatry and injustice? This is what Peter's gonna do all over the place. He's gonna wanna change your perspective. He writes from Rome, and he he tells us who his recipients are. It's Jesus' followers that are in the dispersion. They've been scattered in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Everyone in the room's like, what is that? Okay, here's what that is. Turkey, modern-day Turkey, okay? These were what we would now call states or regions or provinces in this part of the Roman Empire. And what do we know about this part of the Roman Empire historically? Uh, this part of the Roman Empire is largely rural, but it's dotted with some mega cities. Like Ephesus would be like the Los Angeles of the ancient Roman world. It's a melting pot of all sorts of worship. You've got gods and worship coming from the east, and then you've got the Greek pantheon of gods, and then the Roman pantheon of gods, and it's all sort of blended and melted together. If you were to walk the streets of the cities in these regions, what you would see is temples everywhere, and gods everywhere. And what makes this part of the Roman Empire particularly noteworthy as we study 1 Peter, is here. There's a long history of how it got here, but it is here where the worship of the Caesar, it's called the imperial cult, where worship of the Caesar reached its most feverish pitch. It is here where you must bow down and swear swear loyalty to Caesar, not just as king, not just as emperor, but to be worshiped as the divine son of God, there are temples to Caesar that have been, that have been uh, uh, excavated all over this part of the Roman world. In fact, Ephesus has two, not one, but two temples to Caesar. If you walk the streets in ancient Pontus or Bithynia, what you're going to see is temples everywhere and worship of Rome everywhere and swearing allegiance to Caesar And what Peter's going to say is, everything else must bow because there's there's another king, a true king, and he's the one you worship. Now, can you imagine how that might cost you in ancient Turkey? It might cost you relationships. It might cost you business. It might physically cost you. You might physically receive harm. Because to walk around rejecting the idols and injustice of culture and swearing your loyalty to a different king was a radical and dangerous idea. And Peter's recipients are feeling that. Now, let me bring it to our world just to give us something to think through before we turn and sing in a moment. Remember the color guard? When they come out for, like the Razorback games and the, the flags come out, And no matter what flags are represented there, when the star-spangled banner begins, what happens? All the other flags lower, right? Every other flag lowers, then we cross our heart and we sing the national anthem. 
Now, take that concept. What 1 Peter is gonna challenge its readers to do is to recognize that at the name of our true king, Jesus, every other flag must lower. The flag of career, success, pleasure, individual autonomy, title, beauty, all of those flags, politics, party, nation even, they all must lower because we have a true king. He's a king like the world's never seen, and his name is Jesus. To do this, it will require some encouragement because you can see how that might cost you back in ancient Rome and here, can't you? And that's exactly what Peter is doing as he writes this letter. He writes this letter. This is kind of my working purpose statement for the letter of 1 Peter, to encourage the reader, to encourage the reader to faithfully follow Jesus even in a culture that rejects you. Why? Because you've been given a new identity in Jesus. And here it is, God's special treasure. Or in Peter's words, I'll give it to you in Peter's words. You. You. Hear it, you're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You are God's special possession. Why? It comes with a reason. So that you, mo- you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into light. So we're just gonna hit pause. Before we go on, we're gonna dive into the first two verses in just a moment. We're gonna hit pause right now. And I'm gonna pray that I'm gonna invite you to stand in just a second. And we're gonna sing words like Jesus Christ, Messiah. You are our firm foundation. You are the rock on which I stand. Here's what I wanna ask you to, to contemplate as we sing. What flags need to lower in your heart, in your life? You may stand firm on him. I'm gonna pray, then we're gonna to sing together, shall we? Jesus, you are the true king. You are the one before whom we bow. There's no other king like you. No other king lays down his life for his people. And so right now, we reorient, recenter, whatever that word needs to be, to you. We hit pause even in this morning to do so as we sing. We love you, Jesus, as our king. Amen. Would you all stand? Let's reflect on these words together. Grab a seat. We wanted to hit pause right there uh, just, to, just to take a moment and reflect. We're going to do some more just reflecting and resting and meditating this morning. Um, we said at the beginning, it can be really jarring when you find yourself feeling out of place. And not just jar, like it can come with, it can come with some anxiety and some fear. It, it can come with some loneliness even. And that's what Peter's community, Jesus' followers, he's writing to his experience. And I'm sure many of you may feel that way. Even today, as you look out at the world kind of around us, you may feel anxious and fearful and alienated and lonely. What does Peter say then to that community? Then and by extension to the Jesus-following community in this room this morning, if that's you and you're here this morning. Let's take a look at what he says. Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who are elect exiles. Now, circle this, star this, highlight it, put arrows to it, um, put brackets around it. Whatever you do to mark something in your Bible, if you are someone who, who takes notes in your Bible, double underline everything you got, all right? Throw everything you got at elect exiles. If you were to write a book on 1 Peter, this will be in your subtitle. It needs to be in the subtitle, Elect Exiles. Peter's got a community that's scared. They look out at a culture that they feel estranged from. They don't know where to turn. They, they, they believe in Jesus, but man, things have gotten difficult. Now what? He says, hey, hey, to those who are elect, chosen exiles, chosen foreigners, special aliens. Let's look at each one of those words. First, let's look at exile. Now, I recognize that some of you 
may be experiencing this even right now. Like, what would be synonyms for our word exile? So exile might be a general category, but maybe more specific to the, to the context of First Peter, we would use a word like a resident alien or an expat. And some of you may have had the experience of being an expat, or maybe you have that experience right now. You are you're having the experience of being an expat or resident alien. What is the experience of an exile? I've never had this experience. I've only lived in Arkansas my entire life. I'm super brave like that, okay? But what is the experience of an exile, okay, of somebody living in exile? Um, what you reside in one place, and because you reside there, you're not a tourist. You live there. This is your home. Because you reside there, you, you have to learn the language. You try to figure out the best you can the customs, the food, the, the holidays, what they celebrate, and you have to do your best to get along in the place where you reside because you're not just a tourist. But you belong to another place. Your citizenship hasn't changed. Your values, your customs, your native language, it comes from a different place. You don't have the full privileges of citizen. It might be expected you're not staying forever. This might be a temporary kind of thing. When the Olympics comes around, you root for your home country and you sing that national anthem. You know what this inevitably creates, it's going to create some tension. By necessity, it's going to create some tension. Well, let me say it a different way. If you don't like tension, maybe tension is too strong. Let me say it this way. To be in exile or an expat, you have to get used to being weird, different. No matter what you do, you're always a little bit different. You're not really ever going to fit all the way in. And to get along in that environment, to embody this, you're going to have to get used to it. Embrace the weird. Embrace the different. Fellowship, do you know that you're exiles? Have you embraced the weird? Have you embraced being different? Peter's going to say repeatedly in this letter, that's not, that's not your primary citizenship. You've got a different one. Do you know this? Have you embraced it? You see, this tension, it, it's going to require some, some grit. It's going to require some courage to navigate well. Karen Jobes is a New Testament scholar, a First Peter scholar. Really respect uh, her work, and she says this. She says, first, Peter challenges Christians to re-examine our acceptance of society's norms. Re-examine our acceptance of society's norms. I'm just, I can hear some of you internally. I can hear some of you internally going, that's right, that's right. The people on the other side of the aisle, they, they've embraced things that are Wrong, contrary to scripture. The people on the coasts, they don't understand what it's like to live in truth. No. It's easy to do that. It's really easy to do that. And there are some of those things where I would wholeheartedly agree. But notice what she's saying. And let me challenge you. The oh, much more difficult thing is to hold that same mirror up. Where have we embraced society's norms on either side, where are we embracing society's norms where it is contrary to the way of Jesus? And are we willing to hold the mirror up even to the Southern culture? Karen Job says, First Peter challenges Christians to re-examine our acceptance of society's norms and hear it, to be willing to suffer. Willing to suffer. Peter later will say, don't be surprised by the fiery ordeal that's coming your way as if something strange is happening. Willing to suffer the alienation of being a visiting foreigner in our own culture wherever its values conflict with those of Jesus. It's gonna take courage and it's gonna take grit and it's gonna take toughness. 
By the way, this is why the other side of that coin exists. First Peter could be a really difficult letter if all it is is embrace suffering, suffer, you're gonna suffer, get ready, pain. But notice the other side, chosen. The Greek word is eklektoi, to be called out, marked out, selected. You are elect, chosen exiles. And Peter's gonna flood this book with the language of chosen. Now, Edmund Clowney, I think, is helpful here. Hear this. He says, in reflecting on this, you're not choice people. You are chosen people. Do you know the difference? Do you know the difference? What does choice people sound like? Let me, I'll, I'll show you. Choice. First class. Of course. And choice language goes, because of your, your name, last name, because of your title, because of your connections, because of your bank account, because of your success, because of your beauty, because of your morality, because of those things, hey, I'm, I'm choice. I'm superior. We would never, ever say it like that, but we, we feel it. Of course, me. And it's easy to look at all the unchoice people sitting back in the back of the plane. But not me. Can I just tell you what happens? And by the way, none, none of us would say it like that. But we could feel that. Can I tell you what happens when you live in the language of choice people? Our culture loves choice people. We esteem choice people. When you do that, what you do is you necessarily, hear me, you necessarily tether your value, your esteem, and your honor to your last success or to your title, or to your beauty, and guess what? Sign yourself up for a roller coaster ride. Anxiety one day, and courage the next. High one day, low the next. Because you've tethered your value to what you do and how well it is esteemed by other people. Okay, what does chosen language sound like? Let me give you the context of marriage. When you get married, what you are saying is, you're saying to that person, of all the other loves, of all the other people, there's no one like you. I choose you. I delight in you. I want you. I choose you. You are that lovely to me, that desirable to me, that awesome to me. There's no one else like you. That's how special you are. I'm giving my hand to you. Do you see the difference? And those two things, not choice people, but chosen people. Now, we all know that your security in that, being chosen, is only as strong as the integrity and the power of the one doing the choosing, right? If somebody says, you are special, I give my hand to you, your security in that is only as strong as their integrity, well, how much integrity or power is the person doing the choosing to Peter? Notice it. According to the foreknowledge of the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience of Jesus Christ, mark those in your Bible. Your security of your chosenness is only as strong as the power and integrity of the triune God who made the world. That's how strong it is. Take it to the bank. You see why he comes out of the gate saying, you're going to be exiles, get used to it. Oh, but you're chosen. And it's strong because it has the Trinity in and through it. The Father, the Spirit, and Jesus, the Messiah. Have you made the jump from the left side of this sentence to the right? Have you made that jump? Because once you do, it will set you free. Once you do, you will walk in a different way. There will be a joy about you because 
you've been set free. As we close, what's, what's kind of sad about when you read the Bible, it's a little bit surprising even if you ever really go through the whole thing and read it, is the Bible's gonna make some rather dramatic statements about us, you and me, people. It can be a little bit sad even. The Bible's gonna say, and it's gonna come out from the very beginning, and it's gonna essentially tell us, page three, none of us are choice. None of us. And it's gonna weave this theme of exile all throughout the pages of the Bible. See, it begins on page two of the Bible, Genesis chapter two. God, Yahweh, the creator, covenant God, who covenants with people. He brings representative humanity into the garden, Adam and Eve. And he says, I'm giving you all that you need, access to life and joy. And I'm gonna even give you purpose. I'm, gonna, I'm inviting you to be a part of what I'm doing, to work the ground and take care of it. It's an amazing calling that humanity has been invited into. This is what I mean by it's sad. This is on page two, chapter two. We only make it like, Six verses into chapter three. Six sentences in. And already what humanity does, instead of receiving that amazing blessing of God, and saying, thank you, wow, what a gift. Humanity said, no, no, no. We can build our identity, our happiness, our joy on our own terms. We will define right and wrong. We will define what the good life looks like. And as a result, exile. As a result, we're alienated from God and alienated from each other, no longer access to the tree of life. And the pages of Scripture are going to reflect this over and over again, building to this moment to say, hey, all of you, hear it, none of you choice, not one, none of us. No matter your resume, no matter your spiritual, spirituality and your morality, not choice. Do you see then why chosen exiles is such amazing news? And just so you can see how he works this, how does that choosing come to be? He gives us four clauses. I'm gonna stack them so you can see. This is how the, gr the grammar of the passage works. How did that choosing come to be? It was according to the plan of God the Father. This is what God has been doing to call us a people for himself in the sanctification of the Spirit. That's a very churchy-sounding word. The root of sanctification in Greek is uh, the concept of making something holy, also a churchy-sounding word. What does that mean? It means to mark it as special, not for common use. Fellowship, hear it. You're in Christ in the room. Chosen in the making special, the holying, the sanctification of the Spirit with a new king, Jesus, and how does it come to pass? Sprinkling of his blood. Hear it. He becomes the exile. He takes our place as the outcast. He is thrown out. He is reviled. He has people look at him and say, not choice, so that you and I could be brought in and marked as special and holy and chosen and beloved. Do you see? The only way we can live with courage and conviction and not be bounced around are these clauses right here. Jesus takes our place that we might be set free. Here's what we're gonna do to close. Uh, we've got plenty of time. Don't be in a hurry. We're not rushing out of here. Um, we've carved out time. You should have a bookmark that you got as you came in here. Uh, we didn't make a big uh, study book for First Peter. We will in the fall be happy. Um, we've, we've given you this bookmark, and here's what we're asking you to do. We're going to partake in really an ancient practice that dates for, to about 1,500 years ago, and it's called Lectio Divina. You can see it's Latin, which just means a divine reading, and it, we're going to invite you. There's a QR code on there that links you to the daily reading plan for First Peter. Put that bookmark in your Bible, and we're going to invite you to take, uh, take part in these four, uh, it's just four simple things. And the first is you read the passage and reread it and reread it. What words, clauses, phrases begin to stand out? and Meditate on it. So we're gonna practice this this morning. In just a second, I'm just gonna sit down. I'm gonna pray to close. We're gonna dim the lights a little bit, and then we're just gonna give you some space. The verse that we just, the two verses will be on the screen. Read it, and read it, 
and read it. And then what begins to stand out? Ask the Lord, begin to speak to my heart. So for the next 12 weeks, we're gonna be partaking in this ancient tradition together and we're gonna practice it here this morning. Let's, let's do that together. If you don't mind, put the verses on the screen. Let's just read the passage. 